Good evening, friends. We're glad to have you with us again tonight. We're glad for the privilege that we enjoy being able to study God's Word together. And tonight, we're going to study a lesson that was actually planned for the final lesson of our summer series. And we want to talk about buying the ISAV and getting the ISAV from the Lord that we need. But before we begin our lesson, we want to take a little bit of time to sing, to be able to enjoy some praise of God, and then we'll begin our lesson. glad to have this opportunity to be able to study together from God's Word, and I hope that each of us are able to learn something as we think about the spiritual vision that God has given us through His Word. And tonight we're going to talk about, I say from the Lord, taken from Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. This series on spiritual vision has been very valuable for us because it is drawn to our attention the importance of having spiritual vision as much as physical vision. Because it's bad to be blind physically. You need someone to lead you around. You need someone to tell you where to go. But when you think about spiritual blindness, it's even worse. Because many who offer to lead us are in no better position to lead than are we. Many times today we have the sharing of ignorance particularly as we go to the various places of social media, people express their opinions, but their opinions are not based upon fact or truth, but many times they're based upon what they believe or want to be the case. When we go to passages like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, there we read, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. You'll notice Paul is drawing attention to the Gentiles before they became Christians, and he describes them as the times of their ignorance, and he also describes the blindness as being a part of their heart. And when Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, he speaks about people who have failed to grow spiritually, and he says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Yes, it is possible that a person can become so short-sighted, or as we would put it most often, nearsighted. We only see what is close in front of us, and we fail to see the distance. I remember myself when I had um, LASIK surgery done. Before that, I was nearsighted. I could only see what was very close in front of me, but things at a distance were very difficult to perceive. The same thing is true with many people spiritually. They're only living for today, and they're not living for eternity. Well, what we want to do as we approach this passage is to look at three things. We're going to look, first of all, at the context. That's very important. 
Anytime we're going to try to see what's in God's Word, we've got to see it in its context. Second of all, we want to look at the correction that the Lord provided toward them. In other words, here's what you need to do. And then number three, we want to make a few comments that we think are pertinent as we study this portion of Scripture. Let's begin, first of all, with the context. And in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we have seven churches to whom letters were written. And the last of these seven letters was to the church at Laodicea. And Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, records that letter from the Lord. So let's read it now as we begin. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness not be revealed and to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may be able to see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, As we begin to think about this city of Laodicea, it was located in the beautiful Lycus River Valley. That's a beautiful area much like Middle Tennessee. The greenery is there, the water is there, and there's some beautiful cities. You can think about the wonderful city of Colossae, and then you can think about on the other side of Laodicea, the city of Hierapolis, both of them very beautiful places in this wonderful valley. But it was a city that was wealthy, in fact, very wealthy. Behind me, you'll see the main Ephesus Street that is running through the city of Laodicea. And there you will notice that the streets were made out of marble and that the columns decorated each side and there was a beautiful sidewalk. This was a large city with a lot of, of beautiful things within it. But there were three things that the city was noted for. Just like those of us who live here in McMinnville are noted for the nursery that we have the many farmers that will grow the various trees. And we're noted, people will come and say, tell me about this tree or that plant. Well, the city was noted, first of all, for their black wool. The textile industry was very prominent there and they were proud of their black wool and how beautiful it looked. If you drive up to the city of Laodicea now and you're looking to your left as you're driving up to the um, excavation site, you'll see a farmer who has sheep there. Of course, his are not the black ones. But a second reason that the city was very well known was because it was a banking center with the minting of coins. And think about all the thoughts of a rich city, uh, the various temples that would have been located. And again, this is just the beginning of the restoration of this city. And one can be able to just appreciate how beautiful it must have been with all of the buildings that were once there. But then you think about the, the temples and the ones that would go into them. This is on the main street there in uh, the city of Laodicea. And the coins that were minted for Caesar, the beautiful gold coins, 
But the third thing the city was known for was the medical school, which specialized in eye ointment and eye treatment. Today we would call them ophthalmologists. And they would make something very near like a, a bread or a dough, and that would be spread upon the eye and would give eye relief to those who were suffering with that. In fact, there was a god known Aesculapius that uh, was the god of healing. And as you think about the city here, how it was in the context, a city of great wealth, a lot of influence, and known for several things. But you see, the worldliness of the city of Laodicea had infected the church there, and Jesus had to write a letter to get their attention and to tell them they needed to repent. Quite often, civic pride, that of your city, or national pride can be deceiving, just as much as wealth can. And, and people can look and say, we're proud of who we are, and we're proud of where we're from. In Jeremiah chapter 9, we read, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Now, as one begins to appreciate what uh, is being said here, it's obvious to me that the wise man, the rich man, may look and say, look what I have done. And certainly, the Laodiceans might have thought that way when they say, we're rich, we have need of nothing. And it's easy for people to become self-reliant and think that they need nothing. In Hosea 12 and verse 8, we read, and Ephraim said, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they shall find in me no iniquity that is sin. Now that's a thought. The rich man thinks, Because of my wealth, I don't have any sin. I have nothing that I need. And too often we can become self-reliant in thinking that we ourselves have no sin because of the wealth we have gotten. In Proverbs 13, verse 7, we also read, There's one who makes himself rich and yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor and yet has great riches. We recognize that in everyday life. There's some people who have tremendous amounts of wealth, but their life is just a shamble. There's nothing there. On the other hand, we see people who maybe, for instance, have very little to nothing, and they have joy in their hearts. Oh, there's, there's a great difference. Well, as you think about the background of the city of Laodicea, a wealthy city, one of self-reliance, thinking there's nothing that they need. Well, that leads us to our second point, and one that is very significant, and that's the correction offered by the Lord. Because they said, we're wealthy. We have no need of anything. But the Lord said, yes, you do. And the reason why was their vision was distorted. What they saw and what the Lord saw were two different things. And they saw themselves as righteous, needing nothing. That's very much like the man, the Pharisee, in Luke chapter 18. In verses 11 and 12 we read, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You see, this man was congratulating himself and saying, Look how righteous I am. And the Lord said he didn't go down to his house justified because he didn't see his need and didn't ask for God's forgiveness. By the same token, when Paul was writing 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, in verses 12 through 18, but we want to draw attention to just two of those verses. And there, as he brings up the way these people were reasoning in their hearts, he said, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves 
with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Oh, that's a real instructive passage because people who compare themselves to themselves always say, hey, I look pretty good. But you drop down to verse 18 and he says, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commands. You see, my eyesight, spiritually speaking, may not be the Lord's. And what matters is the way the Lord sees me. They did not see their own deficiencies. They did not see their own sins. They didn't see their own needs. Quite frequently you'll be encountering the phrase, what do I lack? What do you want me to do? And as I think about that, I think about the young man in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16 beginning who approached the Lord, and here's what he said. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The Lord told him to keep the commandments, and he said, I've done that since my youth. But then the Lord responds in verses 20 through 22. The young man said to him, All these I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, Go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But the young man, when he heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, prior to encountering Jesus, in his mind, hey, I'm good. I keep the commandments. I don't make the mistakes that other men make. However, the Lord pointed out to him there was something holding him back. There was something he still lacked. What was that? His wealth. In fact, it was so strong in his life that he walked away from the Lord because of it. You see, the correction here is the Lord said, You need to buy from me, I salve, that you may anoint your eyes and see, so that you can be able to see yourself for who you are and what you need. In Psalms 9 and verse 20, the psalmist says, Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. I think about that verse quite frequently as we look at the world in which you and I live. And we see the way people are acting. They act as if they do not answer to God. They act as if they are gods themselves. But he says, I want the nations to know themselves to be but men. That's all they are. When Isaiah was delivering his prophecy, Egypt was wanting to go down to, or uh, Israel was wanting to go to Egypt and be able to put confidence there. And God said, don't do that. And here's the reasoning, verse 3 of chapter 31. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horse is flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall down. They will all perish together. Oh, that sounds a lot like what the Lord said about the blind leading the blind and both falling into the ditch. The truth is, is that if a man cannot see himself and his needs, then he has missed a great eyesight. And he needs to be asking the Lord for that eyesight. Perhaps one of the best illustrations I can think of in reality was the one in the book of Romans. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he talked about being a debtor to all men. It didn't matter whether they were Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female. He wanted to carry the gospel to the whole world and to those at Rome as well, chapter 1, verses 14 and following there. But there was a problem that the Gentile had lived a life of sinfulness. He refused to have God in his knowledge. And because of that, he did all kinds of sinful things. And the Jews would say, yes, that's who they are. But then Paul turned his attention in Romans chapter 2 to the Jewish man. And he pointed out that they needed the gospel and they needed a Savior just as badly. And when you get to chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, he says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we previously charged, both Jews and Greeks, 
that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And by the time you get to verse 23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no one that is perfect. And part of being ready to repent means I've got to see my sins. I've got to be able to have that I salve that the Lord is talking about. And you see what he offers to us in reality is his word because it corrects and it enlightens our vision. I think about wonderful passages like Psalm 19 and verse 8 where David would say, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's like I now can see when Paul wrote the letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Think about that, for correction. I can see what I have done wrong, learn it, and make some changes in my life. And for just a few moments, I'd like to talk about some comments that I think are pertinent as we think about the lesson that is found here. Proper vision is necessary for us to help someone else in their spiritual condition as well. We could multiply numerous passages where we look at other people and may draw the wrong conclusion. When I go to passages like Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Did you notice what the Lord said there? See clearly. The idea that you and I must have in looking at all of this is to see ourselves clearly. That's what the Lord is trying to stress. It's so easy to see it in others, but before I can help someone else, I've got to see it first in myself. The second thing that I want to draw attention to is the fact of what the Lord said earlier in his letter. He said that they were neither cold nor hot, but they were lukewarm. And as such, he would spew them out of his mouth. I believe there's some uh, geographical and cultural reason that the Lord used those illustrations. Because the city of Colossae, which was not very far away, was noted for its cold water running down off of those mountain streams. On the other side of Laodicea was the city of Hierapolis, and it was known for its famous hot springs. In fact, hot water was piped all the way from Hierapolis to Laodicea. A person can just see the conduits of pipes all around the city of Laodicea. But the truth is, when you think about those statements of hot or cold, I could wish that you were either hot or cold. When we think about people, sometimes I think the best thing to do is just compromise. I'm not going to go to the right, I'm not going to go to the left, or I'm not going to go here. Where we should go is where God goes. If it's right, follow God there. If it's left, follow God there. What we need to be is correct. And we need to make sure that whatever God has told us to do, that's what we do, regardless of the way the city or the nation might go. But the third thing I want to notice or a comment to draw out of this is that the Lord saw potential in the Laodiceans. Quite frequently, people will say, and correctly so, the Lord offered no commendation of this church, and he only gave a condemnation of it. That's true. However, the Lord said, be zealous and repent. And then he drew attention to the fact that the reason why he was rebuking them and chastening them was because he loved them. As many as I rebuke and chasten, I love. 
and God still loved the brethren who were at Laodicea, there was some potential there if they would be zealous and repent. And then he uses a very beautiful figure. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And it's as if he, he's there knocking on the door and waiting for someone to open. And he keeps knocking because he still wants us to let him in. He said, if you will open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. You and I need to realize the great lesson in that and the fact that sometimes we have to see who's at the door. It's the Lord. What does he want? He wants to come in to our hearts and for us to love him. The conclusion is here that the Laodiceans had a challenge before them to find the things of real value and pursue them. You see, the Lord had talked about the clothing. He had talked about their financial wealth, their gold, and he talked about the various uh, things of, of the eye salve and the eyes so they could be able to see clearly. Likewise, you and I are challenged to see the true riches in Proverbs 8, verse 18, Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold. Yes, fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. You mean there's something more valuable than gold? More valuable than silver? Yes. Things that are true, enduring riches. Or as Paul would put it in Ephesians 1, and verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, in other words, you're able to see, that you know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Oh, you understand the great wealth that can be found in the inheritance which the Lord offers. And so we ask the question, will you not surrender all to the Lord. Why not give Him everything because He's given you everything? And you and I need to open our eyes to see that, to be able to obtain that eye salve which the Lord had offered, that you and I can truly be able to see properly. We want to thank you again for being with us. We hope that this has been a good opportunity for a Bible study. We'd like to invite you to come and to be back with us again on August the 9th when we'll begin to assemble together again in our building. But until then, we want to encourage you to spend some time studying your Bible. Until then, may God bless you.